Hi guys, welcome back to the channel for another video. Today's video is going to be a review of the BBC documentary with Freddie Flintoff, Living with Bulimia. Now, obviously, as an eating disorder recovery advocate, eating disorder recovery coach, and someone with a lived experience, I look at and review a lot of this eating disorder and recovery content to sort of discuss how effective it is or how responsible it is or whether or not it's safe for people to watch. Uh, and I have not been sort of this personally connected to something in quite some time. So I'm really excited to share it with you guys and sort of my thoughts about uh, what they were discussing there and what was covered. First and foremost, though, thank you so much to all of my patrons for voting on this video. You are super enthusiastic about seeing this. So I hope that everyone else enjoys it as well and you guys are seeing this early hello and thank you for coming to our first live stream this morning that was so much fun uh thank you for all of your questions recovery questions body image for sharing some of your stories and getting to know each other and for us having a bit of a goss about uh dating and my recent dating fails thanks for all of your <laughs> kind words and suggestions about how to not stumble into that situation again <laughs> If you guys want to join us for our weekly live streams, they are an hour every single week. And for $5 a month, you get to come to all of them. You also get to vote on these videos, get early access to them, and you get a shout out at the end of every single video as well. So head to the link in my bio to come and join our little fam over there. Uh, so like I said, we're covering the BBC documentary Living With Bulimia, which is an hour long documentary following Freddie Flintoff, who is a former professional cricket player and now a host of Top Gear. Even I know who Freddie Flintoff is. That's sort of the reach of his celebrity outside of his sporting career. I am not somebody who follows cricket, but see him in a lot of sort of UK chat shows. And he's a really lovely, funny, affable guy. Uh, so even for somebody who's totally cricket illiterate, someone I recognize. So he's speaking out for the first time about his 20 year battle with bulimia. Uh, so he, I remember seeing some articles about this a couple of months ago, but that might've been in the lead up to this documentary. And you guys asked me to cover it and respond to it. So that's exactly what we're doing. And I'm so glad I did get to watch it because it was really informative. It was really affirming and frustrating at times now as a professional wanting to kind of reach through the screen and <laughs> put my two cents in that's not like me at all so in the opening it's pretty clear that not only has Freddie not talked about this personally or explored it for himself personally uh, he certainly hasn't really talked about it publicly but he clearly also has never really sought out professional or medical help or any kind of treatment of any kind I think I, I, this, is, this, this is such a hard thing to define or even admit his only understanding really of his eating disorder is his experience with his eating disorder. When he speaks to the people who are featured in the documentary, he's truly learning about uh, eating disorders for the first time. And that's really interesting because it speaks to the level of denial, right? That he could be living with this for 20 years as eating disorder awareness has kind of got better, still a long way to go, but as it's increased and it's become more, uh, you know, spoken about in the media and people in terms of, you know, celebrities and, you know, advocates speak more and more about it. Clearly, he hasn't gone looking for that information, which, yes, yeah, speaks to that level of denial that the eating disorder likes to employ to keep itself around. And there's a fairly graphic description of purging behaviors in the opening, just as a heads up for anyone who might be triggered by uh, specific behaviors being uh, detailed. That does come up at times. There's also some mention of weights and uh, he is fairly derogatory about his own appearance. So there's some fairly harsh commentary about his own weight and size, etc. But what I think is so interesting about this is that unlike other documentaries where it's an outsider looking in, kind of like Louis Theroux's Living With Anorexia, which we also covered, this is the inside perspective. This is someone figuring it out in real time. And you can see this conflict uh, as he talks about this stuff. So. He talks about the fact that there is, you know, this uh, cycle of on and off behaviors that he can go months without it. And then he'll find that he's purging very, very frequently. And then it'll go back into only occasionally and then rarely. And it's been this cyclical thing over 20 years. But then we find that there's a lot of excessive exercise that plays into that as well. So there's excessive training that he engages with every week. And it's become so normalized to him that whenever it's brought to his attention or it's questioned, like, do you think that that's a reasonable amount of movement to expect yourself to engage with? 
there's clearly this disconnect which comes in. Very, very recognizable to me, not only as a professional, but someone who was incredibly defensive and protective of my behavior, particularly the ones that I thought I could sell as more sort of ordered, like it's movement, people engage in movement, so it's fine. It's not necessarily what you're doing, it's why you're doing it, and sometimes it's how frequently you're doing it that we need to bring our attention to. We also know that eating disorder behaviors can come and go and come and go, uh, particularly when we are relying on it as a coping mechanism, because at times, yes, we might be better at coping using healthier coping mechanisms. And at other times, we're not going to have that capacity and we're going to revert to old behaviors. Uh, we see this in coping or, you know, poor coping skills outside of eating disorders. So just because it goes away for periods doesn't mean that it's any more under control or that it's gone. It just means that it might be in sort of a dormant phase. But if we really haven't unpacked it and addressed it, it's very, very likely, I would say it's guaranteed it's going to swing back around again. One thing that is so clear in this documentary, particularly in some of the opening scenes, is how incredibly self-critical Freddie Flintoff is, particularly of his appearance. He's going through this hall and seeing all these photos from his professional career and he's literally just picking himself apart. And interestingly, when he first got into cricketing, he felt like he was too small. He wanted to gain weight and he wanted to appear like what he thought he should. And he talks about the, his uh, propensity to compare to other people at around the age of 16 when he got into cricketing. And there was this pressure to be bigger. As we get into the documentary, we can see now there is this fear of getting bigger. Now he wants to be smaller. So that just illustrates that the eating disorder can never be satisfied, that there really isn't an ideal. The, the way it wants to keep you stuck is to change the ideal and change the rules and change what you're meant to be doing because while you're chasing all of that around, it gets to hang out and, you know, remain as a tenant in you as the, you know, building uh, and sort of live rent free because you're so preoccupied trying to meet all of its needs and jump over its hurdles, even though they conflict, they contradict each other. It keeps us so confused that we never sit back and go, hang on, mate, like, What's with the totally contradictory value system and not this totally nonsensical way of thinking and, and living and behaving? Uh, that's when you're in it, right? You can't see the woods, woods for the trees. But being outside looking in, particularly from a lived experience, that's what I mean. I really connected with it where I was like, oh, like I remember my eating disorder. Don't get me wrong. But these details, like this feeling is, yeah, it just came back like, oh, I remember what that being submerged in it felt like and not being able to lift myself out and look at what was really going on. So obviously there was already this preoccupation and this uh, this propensity to kind of uh, compare and that he, you know, thought that his body was inadequate when it was smaller. And then incidentally, his body changed. He ended up sort of at a, a higher weight and the media viciously pretty much trolled him. I know that we didn't call it that back then, but they've were vicious to him when you see the headlines and how he was spoken about and he actually hadn't noticed that there was any real change in his weight until he became the target of the British press and like the Australian press the British press they are brutal they get stuck on something and they will just go for someone until they break essentially so he was mortified and humiliated and it was at that moment watching that as someone who's gone through it and as a professional going, the body wasn't the problem, mate. It was the reaction. That's a traumatic experience to have people uh, make any kind of derogatory comment like that on that scale, even on a smaller scale. When I was 15 turning 16, I was viciously humiliated on a beach uh, and called a pig by this bunch of teenage boys. Uh, and I, I, that's really where all of my stuff kicked off as well because it, I internalized this rule, as it's clear Freddie did, that in order for me to be acceptable, lovable, but most importantly, I was never ever going to be humiliated like that again because I wanted to die. I wanted to sink into the sand and never emerge again. Uh, I don't recall other than, you know, terrible loss later in my life, but in my younger years, I can't recall a moment when I felt worse and the rule that I learned was I am only lovable acceptable and worthy of not being humiliated and abused and berated if I 
give all my energy to being in a body that means that that won't happen to me. My body was not the problem. Those tools sitting in their cars are uh, showing off to each other and full of their own insecurity and their own bravado and probably 10 beers. They were the problem, just like the British press was the problem. Uh, so he really internalized that, went on a diet and uh, started to purge and his weight went down and he was celebrated. Isn't this the story that we always hear? Uh, he was celebrated, he was encouraged and you could really see the hurt when these changes happened and everybody liked him. It was this kind of resentment. And I get that. Those boys who I met on the beach, well, not met, who abused me on the beach, I then met them a year later on the same beach and suddenly they wanted my attention. And that was because I was in a smaller body because I was so traumatized by what had happened to me the year before. And that reinforced that message. See, you can avoid awful stuff happening to you you can be acceptable if you do what they've taught you you should do and he experienced this on a monumental global scale not just some idiots in a ute yelling at him so he says everyone was happy with me so he had that validation for his behaviors and why to keep it going uh, so his behavior is escalated because uh, that's what happens with eating disorders. They escalate and they might go away or they might uh, kind of go down for a while. But over time, they tend to just escalate, even though they might be going back and forth. The forward trajectory is always there. He's then talking to the producers saying like he never wants to go back to his old body because, you know, he just can't. He just can't face that notion like the body before he started the behaviors. And uh, that's when it jogged in my mind, like, but he forgets that he didn't actually realize that his body had changed until the press started to uh, bring his attention to it. And that happens with clients as well. Clients will say to me, I, you know, I'd gained weight and I didn't care. I didn't notice. And then people started to comment. People started to bring it to my attention and give me this, you know, uh, idea that it was wrong and that I needed to change it. And before they did that, I didn't feel that way. So comments matter. Uh, this unwarranted commenting on bodies, on weight of any kind, of any size is harmful, damaging, unnecessary. Don't do it. Say something else. Get creative. We don't need to comment on each other's appearances. There's more stuff going on than more or less fat on somebody's body. Uh, so there's clearly uh, body dysmorphia at play because he is sort of referring to himself in a way that insinuates that he really doesn't think that his body has changed that much uh, since engaging with bulimia, where it's evident that it has. And that's, again, not uncommon with eating disorders. That's how it keeps you trapped because you're trying to get an estimation of what you look like and, you know, what do I need to do to fix this? But if you're not seeing that correctly, then the eating disorder can use that to its advantage to say, see, see, you need to do something about this. But we're not seeing what's really there. And it's not the classic, you know, small person seeing a larger person. Body dysmorphia is much more complicated than just like that stereotypical image we're so used to. So he heads off to the Maudsley Hospital where eating disorders are treated. And he meets this young guy, Jamie, who's about 33. And his uh, specialist, Dr. Amari Nassim, uh, and he's talking to Freddie about his experience. He's been in treatment for a while. He also had or has he's in recovery uh, from bulimia. And uh, you can see Freddie having these light bulb moments and he's really surprised by how much he resonates with what this guy is detailing to him and sharing with him. And he actually gets quite emotional and you can see it's really it's scratching the surface of that eating disorder that's clearly kept this protective denial shell going for so long. They are discussing uh, kind of, yeah, back into that kind of denial thing. And this is a big theme in the documentary, which I think is so powerful, where Jamie says, you know, I just thought it was this thing that I did and I really didn't understand why isn't everybody doing it? And Freddie's like, yeah, exactly. And I have said this on this channel before. I used to believe that as well. I used to say to myself, you know, this is just like a trick that I do. This is just, it's not harmful. Like it's, I don't know, why isn't everyone else doing it? And then I got to the point where I was like, I'm sure everyone else is doing it. We just don't talk about it. No, if that is something you are telling yourself, everyone is not 
purging their food. I know everyone with eating disorders doesn't believe that. I did believe it. I know enough people who believe it. People are not purging their food. They are not restricting their food. They are not excessively exercising. They are not taking laxatives. People have an ordered relationship with all those things. So if that's something your eating disorder is telling you to be like, why would you fix it? Everyone's doing it. Everybody is not doing it. But that hit hard because these are the things I forget that I used to think, which is affirming. That's what I mean by personally, it was affirming because it's like, oh, wow, this was this is starting to get to the point where I can't remember the minute details of my eating disorder. There was some not great rhetoric from the clinician they're talking to. There was some kind of like weight management talk, which was not totally appropriate for a treatment uh, context, particularly someone who's exploring treatment, potentially like Freddie. Freddie's not initially in this uh, documentary to be like, I'm getting treatment. He's exploring his situation and whether he would go and get treatment, just to be clear. Freddie talks about the fact that he doesn't even like to use the word bulimia, which Jamie also agrees with. That's something I was even talking about recently that I didn't like actually saying eating disorder or bulimia or anorexia or binge eating disorder because it started with binge eating disorder then bulimia then anorexia I did not feel comfortable using any of those words this is where the specialist turns it around for me and she makes a really great point when Freddie's saying like I don't even know if I want to change it I don't know if I want to get help I don't know if this recovery thing's for me or if I even need it he seems to be doing this roller coaster ride of oh yeah, I need help to, I think this is fine. He does that a lot in this documentary and she makes a really great point that ambivalence or not wanting to get better, that's part of the eating disorder. Just like not feeling sick enough or believing you're not sick enough or it's not bad enough, that's part of the eating disorder. I know that we've spent a lot of advocacy years uh, in the eating disorder space telling people there's no such thing as not sick enough. Uh, That's true. But what we need to start telling people is that not sick enough feeling is part of the eating disorder. That's a symptom. We then see Freddie training and he is very, very, very self-conscious about his body. He's body checking. Um, He doesn't know it's body checking. He's not using that language, Uh, but he's pinching sort of the fat on his stomach. And he, again, has this inconsistent view of himself versus how everybody else sees him. So he... Uh, it's commented on like he trains really hard and he works really hard and you know he's, he's got the great level of fitness and he does not see himself in that way which I, I think a lot of us can resonate with that we get this external feedback of like you look like this or you you're you're this or these positive things about your personality or whatever it is and we go nope don't feel it don't believe it don't get it so we have to keep chasing the stuff that will maybe make us feel like we're good enough and that is just never going to happen unless you do this work that's where it comes from not out here he mentions that his state of mind is exhausting he's like you don't want to spend time in this head and that was another oh yeah i remember what that felt like i remember especially when people would say to me like oh i wish that i had your whatever or that i looked like whatever and i'd be like no you don't i was so angry when people commented on my body or they were um you know, complimentary of my body it made me so angry. It made me so angry because it was like I had to deal with the lie uh, that this was not my body. This was a body that was under duress, that was in pain, that was hurting, that was injured. It's so ironic because I wanted affirmation. I wanted to feel good enough. And as soon as I got it, it made me angry. So then he meets a lady called Pam Nugent and her son, Chris, and they're talking about Her other son, Lawrence, who lost his life to bulimia, he had a heart attack. They're talking about his behaviors and sort of how he uh, spiraled into a very chronic uh, eating disorder. It is tragic. It is too common. They also talk about the fact that Lawrence only went to get help once from a GP who had an awful response to him and he vowed never to seek treatment again. That's how bad his experience was, that there was a response from the doctor essentially saying like, you're a young bloke, like not possible that this is a thing that's affecting you, which is just not true. We know in the UK amongst the sufferer population with eating disorders that it's one in four who are men and that's replicated pretty much uh, over you know most Western countries uh, where we are tracking statistics, which again, isn't great because there's not a lot of funding. Uh, And I I personally believe it's a lot higher than that. I think that the eating disorder numbers are higher just overall, but I certainly believe there's a lot more men suffering from it than we're currently aware of for this very reason that there's such a stigma, there's such a stereotype, 
there's such a message coming from professionals saying that's a women's illness. The other thing that doesn't help that is the, uh, you know, implication that, you know, because it's a women's illness, it's weakness. So men go, well, you know, I'm meant to be, you know, tough and strong. And so not helping that we're characterizing women's illnesses as weakness. Clearly not the case. Uh, a whole lot of bad stuff going on there. He expresses to that family that he believes that currently that he is in control of his eating disorder. Moments later, he says, I know I shouldn't be doing it, but I still can't stop. And this perfectly demonstrates this back and forth between this healthy part of us that goes, I think this is a problem and I think I need help. And then that strong disorder self who goes, uh, this is fine and I've got this under control and the eating disorder isn't controlling me. I'm controlling it, which is a lot of what Freddie repeats in this documentary, which is, oh no, I, I have this under control. The eating disorder is not controlling me. If there is a presence of an eating disorder to whatever degree, you are not ever in control of it. It's just that it has varying degrees of control over you. A few minutes later in the documentary, he says, you know, he is questioning himself throughout this documentary that he didn't realize that he would you know, be going through this process of meeting these people and have all these questions and be reflecting on this the way that he is. But he says that he feels comfortable with where he is. And I literally said out loud, oh God, <laughs> uh, as a professional, genuinely, I was, oh no, Freddie, no, no, no. Uh, there's this bargaining that he's clearly doing at the eating disorder, which becomes apparent later in the documentary where it's like, if I can put up with it the way it is, I'll take it, uh, which we'll get into. So he then reflects on the fact that at a point he took up uh, professional boxing and hated it. But he, one of his reasons for doing it was because he knew that he would lose weight. And one of his goals in his life had been to have abs. And that signified something to him. I was the same. I have a body where I am not supposed to have defined abs. Physically, that's not how fat is supposed to sit on my body. I have fat on my body. It sits where it's meant to. It protects all my bits and my organs, my reproductive system. But that was an ideal of my eating disorder. I hurt myself immensely in the pursuit of that, as he clearly did. As he said, I killed myself to get abs. And then he found himself looking in the mirror, as so many of us have. And he still wasn't satisfied, which is, again, just that constant moving of goalposts to keep you stuck. Then he meets Aiden, who has been in recovery from bulimia for two years. He was also a professional boxer. And that's how his bulimia kicked off, is that he was expected to be in this certain weight class. And he started throwing up his food in order to pursue that specific weight. Uh, he believed if he stopped boxing, then the bulimia would go away. But it didn't. It became more and more chronic. And finally went to the GP. He went into recovery. It's important, as they did in the documentary, to note that athletes are actually at a high risk of developing an eating disorder, regardless of your gender. Uh, and uh, this is clearly something they're touching on in the documentary, which is really, really important because it's not a terribly well-known statistic. Freddie shares again with Aiden that he feels like he's at a point where he's in control of the eating disorder. And thank goodness for Aiden, he shares, yep, I felt that way as well. But Freddie could see through what he'd already shared from his story he was like oh my goodness like from the outside looking in like clearly you were so unwell and he's like well I felt exactly how you feel right now which is why lived experience is so powerful and Freddie touches on this where he's like how do you explain to someone what is uh going on what this experience is like and this is the power of these communities that we have, our place on the internet, professionals who have a lived experience, whether it's coaches, dietitians, psychologists, is that we can get into the work because we don't, I don't need you to explain to me the contradictions. I get it. I've told myself all the same things. And we have this shared language uh, where we might not have identical experiences, but that life in our head is so tragically similar. Uh, and I think this was clearly really powerful for Freddie to break through some of that denial. After his chat with Aiden, Freddie says something really, really beautiful and reflects on his own reluctance to talk about his eating disorder, which is that he felt like it would be a display of weakness, that he should be tough and strong, particularly with his background and where he comes from. And then he shares that the strength is telling people. And that's so true. Uh, I think a lot of us who end up with eating disorders are hyper terrified of being vulnerable i think most people are terrified of being vulnerable but hyper hyper terrified either because we've been taught 
or we've learned at some point that vulnerability means that you are you know really 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 unsafe uh, and so we build up this protective mechanism between us and the world that actually hurts us far more than what the world could ever do to us and to talk about that particularly an, uh, a mental illness which is still so stigmatized and particularly for uh, demographics who don't see themselves in the stereotype and don't see themselves in a lot of awareness raising uh, it is the strong thing to do rather than to live in the shame and to shut it down and to to lead the way for people. And that is what Freddie is doing. There are not a lot of men who speak openly about this and particularly with his platform and his reach, it is going to change lives for sure. There will be, I can see my experience in his experience for young men who idolize him and look up to him and are living in that headspace this is going to be the first time they've felt understood. He then recalls speaking to a dietitian when he was still a cricketer, uh, the time when he had decided he was going to finally get help. She came to speak to the team about nutrition, etc., and that there's a high rate of eating disorders with female athletes and then made the comment, we won't have any of that in this room, will we? And he shut down and sort of decided that was his sign that he was not going to reach out. So two examples in a one hour documentary of professionals failing individuals because they should do better. And before I get into a heated rant, this that'll make this another 30 minutes long. Uh, we'll save that for another video topic, shall we? I have a lot of feelings, particularly as someone who works on treatment teams and hears this garbage all the time. Anyway, um, so I have a note here which says, professionals, be better. <laughs> uh, so he meets another dietitian within the context of the documentary and she is, she's pretty excellent. So he, she gets him to obviously give her a bit of information about what he's eating, what his routine looks like. And uh, he's, I can see even from what I see written on that sheet that he is clearly restricting. So there's not just binging and purging behaviors, there's restriction as well, which guys, Super common. I have very rarely come across clients where I don't, they come to me and they're like, oh, I binge and purge or I binge. And I'm like, great, let's talk about your restriction. They're like, no, 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 I don't restrict. I'm like, let me be the judge of that. <laughs> Send me your diary of your food. Uh, let's see what's going on. And 99% of the time, there is some kind of restriction going on, whether it's, you know, delaying food or the amount of food, whatever it is, or the thinking about food, it's all, it all, counts or has a, a sort of uh, pendulum swing that comes backwards. She does make the comment, however, that, uh, you know, it's never about, it's never just about food. It's never just about body image. I think that's an unwise comment to make. We can't make blanket statements about why people's eating disorders develop uh, because it is so much that down to the individual. Yes, a lot of people uh, develop them because of poor self-image, trauma, etc. But it's a perfect storm for everyone. It's their own uh, factors. And I, I just don't think we should be saying like, it's definitely not that because you'll have people watching who it either is or they believe it is and they go, oh, well, then I don't have an eating disorder because for me, it's just about body image, right? In this interaction with her, showing her photos of himself and how he's commenting on himself, his body dysmorphia is clearly fully on display. And she touches on the trauma of what he went through in his career where he was being body shamed and said pretty much what I touched on earlier in this uh, video, that his body was not the problem. The way he was treated was wrong and it shouldn't have happened and was obviously traumatic as it would have been for most people who would have gone through something like that, that the solution was not for him to hurt himself the solution would have been for somebody to help him navigate how he was feeling about how he was being treated and to address other people's poor behavior which is so true uh we think yeah that we can mitigate other people's terrible terrible behavior and values by hurting ourselves and you can't and he is saying throughout the documentary like i've got a great life i've got a great job i've got a fabulous family i love my kids i love my wife if this is something that I have to uh, put up with or accept to have all of that, like I'll take it. And she said exactly what I thought, which is, but you don't have to. Uh, it's not a price you pay. You don't have to do these things. You don't have to have the body that your eating disorder self is telling you that you have to, to be loved, 
to be, you know, to follow your passions, to have the things that you want. Uh, In fact, if you remove the eating disorder and you work your way through it, life will get better. All those things that you think that are contingent on what your eating disorder is doing, you will have them and you will have the full technicolor experience of them without the cloud of the eating disorder. That's when they flash up this frightening statistic that 60% of men with eating disorders do not seek treatment, uh, which I would love to see change, certainly in my lifetime or in my career. They then flash forward to four months later to Freddie on an exercise bike. And he's talking about the fact that he has lost weight and that that was sort of his goal to do that. I sort of, I wrote a note which said he is in its grip. Uh, And that's where, again, you can tell that somebody can't see the woods for the trees where here he is doing a documentary on his eating disorder. And he's just very casually talking about excessive exercise and like this weight loss goal but yeah let's go and talk about uh you know seeing a specialist about an eating disorder sort of thinking they're two separate things when they're not so he then goes to speak to dr nasim who we saw earlier in the uh documentary with jamie he can't imagine getting better is sort of what he expresses or what that would look like and he's clearly fearful, which so many people are. I don't have anyone who comes to me and is like, I just totally accept this process and I have no fears and no anxieties and this is going to be fabulous. And of course, part of this is not knowing. Uh, If you're waiting for the light bulb to go off and be like, I am ready to recover, you're going to be waiting forever. Anything that's worth doing is scary and recovery is one of the most worthwhile things you could ever do in your life. Unfortunately, we don't finish with anything too definitive with Freddie talking about going and getting help. He just says that it's his intention to get help, that he doesn't want to lie. Uh, he wants uh, to keep, obviously, that door open, but he there's no clear path about him seeking treatment in any kind of official capacity. I really hope he does seek treatment. I hope for the sake of himself and his family and his ability to enjoy his wonderful life as fully and in total color as he can, that he does seek treatment. I think this uh, this is a excellent documentary. I have not said that about too many, you know, eating disorder <laughs> pieces of media. I think this is an excellent documentary. I think that anybody who wants to uh, understand eating disorders, I don't know so much that you're going to get too much information out of it. I think that it's one that's probably more affirming for people in the experience you know, hopefully moving towards recovery or people who are in recovery. There are mentions of specific weights that nothing that's too uh, heavy handed. There is obviously the derogatory commentary from uh, Freddie about his own body, but this is his experience. So we've got to keep it in that context. There's only one or two comments from professionals where I'm like, I don't love that. It's not totally irresponsible, but it's not, you know, from a treatment philosophy perspective, something that I totally agree with, but it's powerful. It is super powerful. I think that it will have an incredible impact on the people who need to see it, which will particularly be men who are suffering. I think that if you're going through it, obviously with anything that is centered around eating disorders, go in with caution uh, and you know manage your own triggers as best you can. If you're someone who's very, very, very vulnerable to triggers at the moment, like anything else, give it a pass. I hope Freddie gets help. That's what I finished off feeling. And feeling immensely grateful for my own recovery and that even though I also didn't believe I could recover and I also didn't believe that life could get better, I am so happy to have been wrong. And you, if you don't believe it, you will be wrong too and you will be grateful to be wrong. Okay, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this. If you saw the documentary, come and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Come and join us on Patreon. We'll be having our next live stream next Thursday. Like I said, they're every single week uh, and that's for $5 a month. You get four live streams and all the other bonuses as well. Go and head to my link in the description box below. I'll see you guys next uh, Friday with another video. Much love. Take care. See you soon. Bye.